Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. And this week, you're in for a treat because my guest isn't just a razor-sharp observer of the American culture wars, she's also wickedly funny, in person as well as in print. Her name is Nellie Bowles, whom you might know from her work covering Silicon Valley at the New York Times until she quit in 2021 after observing, or perhaps enduring is the better word, her newspapers slide into vicious social justice bullying among young members of the editorial staff. Since then, she's helped start up the popular LA-based journalism outlet, The Free Press, with her wife, Barry Weiss. And she's also found time to write a great new book called Morning After the Revolution, Dispatches from the Wrong Side of History, which chronicles progressive America's descent into extremism and social panic during her tenure as a journalist, especially following the 2020 murder of George Floyd. Bowles is an unrepentant liberal who still rhapsodizes at great length about the bohemian wonders of her native San Francisco. But don't worry, I edited most of that stuff out. The point is that her book isn't one of those one-sided culture war manifestos from a left-wing blowhard who suddenly becomes a right-wing blowhard. Her analysis of how BLM, gender activism, harm reduction, and police reform all slid into crankish extremism is informed by empathy, nuance, and, most importantly for me, good humor. Along the way, we talk about other liberals who got mugged by reality, such as fellow American culture war chronicler Jesse Single, whom the extreme left has been trying to pillory since his groundbreaking Atlantic magazine cover story about the concerns surrounding pediatric gender bending. And Faisal Khan, whose name you might not know, he's a humble retailer who got targeted by Antifa thugs in Seattle after he pointed out that, hey, maybe running a lawless gang-led urban enclave wasn't, you know, the best thing for middle-class retailers trying to make a living in Seattle's gay village. Please enjoy my interview with Morning After the Revolution author, Nellie Bowles. So the subtitle here is Dispatches from the Wrong Side of History. And after reading the book, which I like very much, I was trying to describe it to my colleagues. And I said, well, it's kind of a memoir but it's almost like a memoir written in modular form. You're charting your own kind of ideological evolution, but you're doing it by way of these episodic chapter by chapter descriptions of stuff you're seeing as a journalist. In fact, I think a few chapters are actually adapted from published long form journalistic accounts in Atlantic magazine, for instance. Is this book what you thought it was gonna be? It started out as me being really frustrated as a New York Times reporter and feeling like there were all these stories I wanted to go and report on. And I, I thought of it as I was writing it as like a collection of essays, but it's not a book that has one distinct argument, although my editor probably would have wanted me to have that. There is a coherent narrative that comes out of this, which is that you're someone maybe, I don't know, these terms are loaded, but like kind of classical liberal or leftist or progressive, as that term was understood, like, you know, last Thursday <laughs> before progressives wanted to like abolish prisons and, um, and whatnot. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I came of age, I, I grew up as a good progressive, good lefty, whatever you want to call it. I get the sense you still are pretty on the left, from what I can tell. Oh, I would still consider myself a liberal, like a bit of moderate or a centrist liberal, whatever. In the book, I say um, my politics now are more exhaustion than doctrine. Mm. So I grew up, grew up in San Francisco and fit in really well in elite prestige world, got all the right credentials, did a Fulbright, got my literal dream job working as a features reporter at the New York Times. There's no other dream I had. And a little bit, I think the book maybe is kind of a coming of age or like a me getting over a naive worldview, which was that this prestige world was exactly what it was saying it was. That when, when legacy media says, we want you to nurture your curiosity and go explore the big stories and have an open mind and report on things that you see and that are interesting and that are important. And don't bring your politics into it as much as humanly possible, which of course is impossible to ever do anything pure, but like to try your best. And I really believe that. And then obviously in 2020, we all saw the complete erasure of that old world mindset, the complete abandonment of it. 
And I was stuck feeling a little bit unmoored from the world and the community that I always considered myself very much part of. But like, to me, it was just impossible for me to not be curious about what was happening in Seattle when Antifa took over right. whole neighborhoods. It was impossible for me not to be curious about the corruption of BLM. Where were they spending the money? Why was no one looking into it? Like, it was impossible for me not to want to report on that stuff, to be curious about that, to be curious about Antifa, to be open-minded about the idea that abolish the police or even defund the police maybe wasn't just this perfect ideology. Maybe it had flaws or maybe there were other consequences. To, to be wary of those things was to put yourself very much outside of mainstream journalism and outside of the acceptable norm of liberalism. The, the kind of personal evolution throughout that is me becoming a little bit like, what in the hell is going on? And why is asking that so shocking? And then reporting on those things. So reporting on what defund looked like and the kind of people who were trying to sell that philosophy versus the people who were actually living in it. It's not catcher in the rye, but there's a certain coming of age quality to what you've written. And the Nelly who exists when she walks in to the New York Times is not the Nelly who wrote this book. And the book provides a coherent account of why. Maybe the book is so good because you didn't set out to do that. There's lots of books that like, you know, why I left the left or why the right is right or, you know, <laughs> why, why I went from left to right. But they're often written in the self-conscious style to demonstrate why, you know, everything I thought before was garbage and everything I think now is the God-given truth. <laughs> I'm, I'm just much more sure of myself now, I would say. At many key points in the book, you do not strike a heroic posture. It's kind of the opposite. So there's one scene. I think you were at this bizarre street protest. I think it was in Los Angeles where these trans Tifa protesters, they were outside some kind of like gym where, where these middle-aged women had run this dude out of the, the sauna because he was like lounging around fully naked and this whole subplot about whether he had an erection, which we don't have to get into. <laughs> and there was this big protest. And as happens at these protests, completely unstable. So, you know, it's, it's sort of like the mob from The Simpsons. They were attacking some guy. You describe him as this curiously nonchalant tall guy. And you yourself, even though you were completely horrified by the protest, were like, oh, yeah, no, I, I'm not with this guy. I don't know who he is. You kind of distance yourself from him. The tall guy. And then there was a sort of conservative video journalist who was there. And as I'm covering this, in the scrum, watching this, trying to document it, the group turns on this guy. And at first I thought they were looking at me and I was like, oh my God, I don't want a bunch of Antifa looking at me. What do they know? I don't know. This is stressful. But then I realized they're talking to the guy who had just been standing next to, who was really sweet. And my response was to say, I, I'm, I'm not part of this. I don't, <laughs> threw I don't know this guy. And I'm, <laughs> I, I, I had to walk to, to put my hands up and walk away and, and to to be scared. I mean, you know, I'm not the hero of these stories by any means. It wasn't like a this will not stand moment. No, there's no there's there's no part of the book where I'm like this heroic figure because I, I don't the, the best thing I did was not cancel someone one time, basically. And then and, and very reluctantly at that. I didn't really think of it that way. But yeah, no, it's not. It's not a, a, a tale of my heroism, which makes it more credible. It's a tale of me wrestling with these situations and trying to do my best and trying to figure them out. And often, at least at the start, choosing careerism, right. choosing my own vanity, choosing whatever will be helpful to get me further or to keep me in the good eyes right. of the American prestige world. And I think over the course of the book, I become a little less obsessed with that. But yeah, part of it is a kind of self-reflection on being part of a movement that did things that were cruel or believing in things that were crazy. I mean, I don't think like a ton of my actual political beliefs, like I'm, I didn't be, go from pro-choice to pro-life right. or something like this. But the, the only one I do think about as like a real flip-flop is I used to be really pro-legal drugs, like totally legalization. And just to be clear, I'm in Canada where you can buy marijuana at the corner store. You're talking about heroin, fentanyl, like the hard stuff. Yeah, only because it was like, I don't really want police resources used for like a random guy who's using heroin and he should just be helped. And why do we need him in jail? Harm reduction. That That's one where I have fully flipped up because anyone who has seen the streets of West Coast cities would be a fool to stand by that. 
And I think Oregon just in a full recriminalization after a decriminalization. Now you're in LA now. In your book, I learned you and your neighbors, it's like, I don't know, living in Central African Republic or something where you're literally paying a bunch of retired cops to show up if thieves break into your house because the regular cops aren't going to come. Like That's weird. It is super weird. I think California has enormous problems. And I'm yeah, that's a big topic in the book for sure. I think why I'm still hopeful is because over the last few years, let's take San Francisco, you have seen a reformation of sorts. You've seen a moderate faction mm. who, of course, are called fascist monsters, right. and they're just going to They're Nazis. Like, they're literal Nazis. They're literal Nazis. They're, they're like these nice Democrats. It started with um, a group of Asian parents who wanted to bring back eighth grade algebra. That's how Nazism literally started. That's literally Nazism. I am experiencing violence, even just recalling it. <laughs> so I saw this reformation that was happening over the course of the years of reporting this. And so it did give me hope that to not say, you know what, screw these places, screw it, like screw California, screw Seattle. We don't need any of these states anymore. Let's all just like move to Austin and make a new life. And there's a lot of people who do that. And that's great. But I'm still hopeful about a reformation within liberalism and within these cities, these beautiful, beautiful cities, this, this beautiful land. Like, why should why should it be given up to the craziest faction? Well, so you say beautiful land, but there's one story. I think it's in this book. It must be in the book because it was it was so artfully told that it must be in the oh, book. So, so yeah. it must be so beautiful. <laughs> You're basically talking about what used to be called limousine liberalism, but I think that expression is probably 20 years out of fashion. Uber black liberalism, maybe. Yeah, that's more modern variant. But where you had like some real estate development that would have supplied dozens, if not hundreds of homes for people, but it was held up, at least temporarily. Essentially, well-heeled incumbent landowners didn't want this development going through because, I don't know, it would destroy their view of the harbor or something like that. Community garden. It, it was a beautiful community garden. Community garden. Because, yeah, because that's what we need, like four more eggplants. So <laughs> to me, that we've had other guests on the podcast who, you know, have used different terms to describe this. The idea of progressivism being a creed that was originally about helping truly marginalized people in society, but has kind of been co-opted into or maybe weaponized in some cases, in favor of, of wealthy people who mm. you know, maybe use pet environmental causes, or in some cases, they're just dilettantes, like they don't know much about issues. And they, you know, whether it's Gaza, or whether it's fentanyl, or whatnot, is that they just latch on to whatever they read in their Facebook group. I'm going to harp on your telling comment, because I agree with it, about the Asian parents. Because that's what happened in Vancouver, is in Vancouver, in the last mayoral election, we had this guy who was whiter than me, who was the mayor, and he was like super woke. He's like a former musician. He's just like everything that's terrible. <laughs> and, and what happened is he would go to Chinatown, and he was booed by local entrepreneurs, first and second generation immigrants, who they didn't care what his pronouns were. They didn't want to hear his land acknowledgement. What they wanted was safer communities. They wanted yeah. more opportunities for their kids. And they weren't cowed in the same way as like maybe even someone like me who doesn't want to say anything that might be sound bitten on Twitter in a way that makes me sound like, you know, a literal Nazi because they're not on Twitter. And they, I don't want to simplify things. There's, there's lots of constituencies here, but they ended up being the voice for reform. And they also, they helped swing the municipal election in favor of a more common sense candidate. These aren't constituencies that are like super online or super left or super right. They just kind of want the same common sense things that I think a lot of families have. And it, it sounds like you're describing there are families in California like that, too. I think you're seeing that dynamics playing out across America, where you have the wealthy elite with a set of political beliefs that don't really actually match or help the middle class or lower middle class or poor. And that's been beautifully, I think, described by um, Rob Henderson in Troubled. He, he has a term called luxury beliefs. You've got Bajo Angar Sargon, who's doing great work on that. How I found it in my life and through this book a little bit was I grew up as a privileged American, went to private schools. And a lot of the popular leftist ideas that are the dominant ideas and sort of taken as, as complete fact in mainstream media today, ideas around elite public schools are racist that supply and demand is fake and building market rate housing will not help lower rent prices, that police are inherently racist. And, you know, all of these ideas made a lot of sense to me from a privileged white kid perspective, because it was never relevant. When I was a kid, I 
The only time I met a police officer was when he came to school to show us his shiny car and stuff like that. Like it wasn't, it wasn't part of neighborhood life. And I don't have relatives. I'm Jewish. You know, I, I don't, I don't have police officers who are relatives. So, I mean, I can see why people become vulnerable to this. And because they're beautiful philosophies, they, they rely on a sense of human goodness. You use the term utopian. Yeah. And it's a very lovely notion. This is what gives your book, I think, such a tragic comic aspect is it isn't an Ann Coulter book where it's like, <laughs> these people, they're all liars. They're all treacherous. They're all this, they're all that. The word you use is utopian, that this is a utopian vision. Imagine a world where it is like out of a John Lennon song. Imagine, you know, there's no police. Imagine there's no landlord. Imagine we got all our food from the community garden. Exactly. And that is a nice vision, right? Like it's not... That's not an evil vision. That's nice. It's a beautiful vision. It relies on believing in such profound goodness. I mean, it's it's right. gorgeous. If if you really believe that we can abolish the police, you really believe that humans naturally want to be good. Yeah, in jails. That humans naturally want to be good. But the only reason they're bad is because some outside force in poverty, they're oppressed in some way. That that humans by nature will never do, they won't steal, they won't hurt each other if they're just given the resources strangeness of that idea because obviously rich people steal all the time but whatever or let's say trans stuff women feeling anxious about let's say um biological males in a female prison or biological males in a women's changing room you have to believe that people are so profoundly good to right. think that a man with ill intent would never take advantage of that, especially with things like self-ID. Well, you just say, I'm a woman and you walk in. You, there's no, there's no like registration system. There's no like doctor's note necessary. And the idea that no man will ever take advantage of that. There's a reason why a lot of the old school feminists bristle at that notion, because it, it requires belief in people behaving so purely. And we just know that's not how people behave. I went to university, I had friends who were in a fraternity who literally spent like 30 or 40% of their waking lives figuring out how to trick women into having sex with them. <laughs> Using every trick in the book to try and maximize your chance of finding women in a place where they might be persuaded to have sex with you. And the idea that this group of people if they magically said, hey, you know what, I think, uh, I, think I have a female gender identity that they would like magically lose all of that boorishness, all of that quasi predatory instinct, which by the way, has an evolutionary basis. Doesn't mean every man's a rapist, but there's a reason most sex crimes are committed by men. Utopian is a nice word for it. There are other words for it. Naive. It kind of shows the capacity of the human brain to ignore common sense at the behest of ideology. Yes. But what I like about your book is that you admit that the ideology itself isn't evil. It ends up in a place of often hysteria mm. and social panic. Empathy given very strongly only to one group. But the groups change. During Me Too, every man was rightly seen as a potential threat. It went from believe women to shut up, Karen. Yeah. When it came to threats in locker rooms, in spas, in sports, in prisons. Yeah, exactly. One thing that is a theme in your book and I've noticed this when it comes to progressive social panic, is in many of these controversies, the great Darth Vader, the great villain of the story, isn't a Republican politician. It's not a conservative. They are much more furious at people who they see as apostate liberals. Yes. In their universe, J.K. Rowling is worse than like Senator McConnell. Like, I know people who aren't online and just take a gander at Twitter, they like come to me and say, John, who is Jesse Single? Why do these crazy people hate him so much? They're like, I've never heard of Jesse Single. And if you don't know who Jesse Single is, you probably shouldn't be listening to this podcast. <laughs> there are people like Barry Weiss, who I think you've heard of. There are people like J.K. Rowling, Kathleen Stock, Helen Joyce, people who are essentially on the left, but have committed a heresy on one issue. Often it's gender. It's not always gender. Sometimes it's Israel or something like that. Tell us about how Faisal Khan came to be the villain of the moment. Basically, when a group of Antifa took over a neighborhood in Seattle, they put up their own borders. 
they said that police and ambulances wouldn't be allowed in. This is the Chaz Chop. Exactly. Was it Chaz at first and became Chop or which, which one? It was Chaz at first and rebranded to Chop. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it was nice for a few, you said for a few days, it was very nice. It was, it was very, it was fun. And, and it stayed that way forever, right? <laughs> exactly. But, but a group of business owners, as it wore on, banded together and said, this is actually not okay. Like we we're our shops are going out of business. We need people to come be able to come in. Uber Eats wouldn't come in. And and the Antifa members were just sort of becoming um local mafias. Like guys would show up and say, Hey, you've got to pay me. I'm your new security team. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying a power vacuum strengthens local gangs? Who saw that coming? <laughs> I know. I was shocked. Faisal Khan is a man who is running a lovely coffee shop sandwich place in the area and he and a few other business owners eventually joined together to sue the city and to say you guys can't let this happen the city was sort of winking and nodding and helping it out they were providing porta potties they were providing blood they they were kind of making it easier for this to maintain and 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 i think basically the taxpayer funded city of seattle liked this project and liked this antifa zone and and thought it was pretty cool and wanted to support it. They wanted to be on the side of, of revolution. So anyways, he and other people in this neighborhood, other business centers in this neighborhood, the neighborhood, by the way, being Seattle's gay neighborhood, like these are all people who came to this area to live a good, happy life in the gay neighborhood, um, became targets of rioters or whatever you want, the Antifa, the new government. There is a obsession with dissident liberals or liberals who aren't on the side of whatever this most extreme version of the talking point is that day. And it's a political move. It's a move to try to get the whole party or the whole of America to move leftward. And what's the biggest threat to a leftward move? It's the moderate. It's the boring business owner who's like, oh, he's there, he's gay, he's uh, selling coffee. And But if he's not on board with full Antifa, then he right. is the biggest risk to the movement. He's the Menshevik. Yeah. It's not between parties. It's it's a battle, a revolution within liberalism. And I mean liberalism like really broadly. It means the blue states, obviously. It also means the blue cities in red states. And it also means like our university system, right. our a lot of our cultural institutions are part of this. And it largely ignores, actually, the right. And it largely ignores Trumpers. Well, they might as well be in outer space. Yeah, they're irrelevant. The whole project is moving, let's say, your museum from being a normal liberal... To an anti-racism museum, yeah. To being an anti-racist museum. From moving the university, from being a normal university that wants to teach you know, the best physics class they can teach, to being a school that thinks that physics itself is problematic. So, so the, the moderate liberal, the Jesse Single, who I don't even know if he's a moderate liberal. I don't know what his politics are exactly if I asked him. But, but he, of course, is the enemy. He's the obsession. Like, of, of course, I would be or Bear would be for listeners. Bear, Bear is my wife. So you call her Bear? I call her Bear. But, but of course, we would be the problems. I'm a lesbian who believes in all these things. And how is it possible that... I wouldn't also be on board with Abolish the Police. How could that be? And now a commercial message for some of you who, like me, worry that we've lost the art of public debate, and with it, the ability to think for ourselves. This episode is brought to you by The Monk Debates, where the world's leading thinkers debate the most pressing issues of our time. And the next Monk Debate is one I promise you will not want to miss. The subject is anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism. On June 17, UK-based commentator Douglas Murray, a former Quillette podcast guest, and international law expert Natasha Hosdorf will debate former MSNBC anchor Mehdi Hassan and Israeli Haaretz columnist Gideon Levy. The debate will take place near the Quillette studios here in Toronto, but if you're looking for a polite Canadian-style exchange of views, this is not what you're going to get. Putting aside the obviously controversial topic, Douglas Murray and Mehdi Hassan have exchanged a lot of heated rhetoric over the last decade. Some might say they don't like each other very much, to put up mildly. But they've never debated in public until now. As I said, the debate is taking place here in Toronto, but it will be live-streamed so that you can watch it from the comfort of your home wherever you live. To find out how to become a Monk Debates member and watch the debate live, go to www.monkdebates.com. The world is ready to debate. The Monk Debates invite you to listen. Head to monkdebates.com for more information. 
And now back to the Quillette podcast. And you know, here's a guy, you've probably met him. He's like, you know, maybe 5'3", 150 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> you know, he's descended from Asian immigrants. And when he was attacked by street thugs, by Antifa street thugs, like it was five years ago, I had people here, here in Toronto, people at the Toronto Star, our left-wing newspaper here, they were cheering. I mean, they, they, they thought it was great. Of course they yeah, were. It was disgusting. Because nothing matters more than the political goal. The near enemy. Exactly. All of these things have been described a million times in a million generations, right? Like this isn't human nature is what it is. We're stuck with these patterns. Like, yeah, the near enemy. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, journalists at every publication basically, if not celebrated that, treated it as, well, he kind of deserved it. David Remick, the editor of The New Yorker, I'm quoting here from your book, he wrote a meditation at the height of the protests. This is Antifa protests asking, I'm going to put my New Yorker voice on here. Who really is the agitator here? He cites Martin Luther King Jr. Even looting, King insisted, is an act of catharsis, a form of shocking the white community by abusing property rights. You know, he's got this kicker. The guilty one is not he who commits the sin, but he who causes the darkness. You go from there into NPR running a piece in defense of looting. You talked earlier about how you were chasing the vanities and baubles of professional success. Well, New Yorker and NPR, the leading lights of American journalism. So there must have been two Nellies, one who wanted to go, you know, write for the New Yorker, one of the, the few places more esteemed than the New York Times. And the other Nelly, who's like, oh, my God, this is bullshit. Was there a war between two Nellies? Yeah. Initially, it took a lot of suppressing of reasonable instinct. Cognitive dissonance. Yeah. The trouble with me is the reason I got into journalism is that I have a kind of itchy, suspicious personality and I just can't go along with things very well. Like I was never good at like group projects as a kid or, or anything like that. Anyone who's been reading the news over the last four years has seen the complete collapse of, let's take NPR, of a place like NPR into the most eccentric left-wing political... I used to be obsessed with NPR. I used to listen to NPR all the time because it was like, ah, the voice of sanity. And then in a space of like, what, two years, it went from wither Iraq to, hey, let's loot Macy's. They came out proudly saying, we will not cover the Hunter Biden laptop story. We, as the newsroom, have decided it's not a story. I mean, that wasn't done subtly. It wasn't that they came out proudly to say that. The very idea of publishing manifestos like that is itself weird super weird when you say oh you know you were always kind of iconoclast and went your own way and sought your own truths that's kind of the stereotype of the lionized journalist in media you know the idea of journalism as being this consensus-based groupthink project that was never what journalism yeah. was idealized as that's that's like a new thing that comes from the age of twitter i think now generations who to blame young people i blame young people <laughs> obviously the young people <laughs> yes yes you're not old enough you're not old you. enough to say I'm, young people no, no no it's it's our generation's fault it is to some extent my generation's fault but who are we raised by i mean this is i think the boomers have just as much at their feet for this as, as the millennials do just as much at their feet just as much blame at their feet i think that the boomers played a very active role in setting the stage for this, that there is no truth, that there is no better or worse, that there is you know, a lot of stuff that was very trendy in academia and that a lot of the generation above me brought in as chic. Journalism used to be a trade. You know, you'd walk into a newsroom, I guess, in the 70s or 80s, I mean, it was before my time, but you'd find a lot of people without college educations. Mm. David Brooks has written about this. It got taken over by like downwardly mobile rich kids who needed something to do before they went to law school. And those are the people mm. who ruined it. You're a Fulbright scholar. So I I'm, I'm probably one of them. Yeah, you're definitely I'm one part of, of the problem for sure. But you're repentant, which is, which is why you're on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, journalism is a trade. It's not a priesthood. I always tell that to everybody. It's a trade. It's not a priesthood. That's where the problem starts. Mm. If you acknowledge that you're a hack, that you're a curious person, <laughs> that's my approach at Quillette. I'm a curious person who wants to write about things that interest me. You'll never go wrong because you won't think, you know, will I be disappointing my parishioners if I write this sentence? Like as soon as you start thinking like that, you're screwed. 
Now, so I want to ask you about the New York Times because people are obsessed with the New York Times. And I think a lot of people are going to read your book because... Oh, but God, at this point, it's been written about so many times. The, well, the yeah. year 2020, if I read one more, I can barely read my own words about 2020 New York Times. Again, to give you more credit than you're giving yourself, you write about it with nuance because, first of all, I'm going to say, I, I, I like the New York Times. I've been a seven-day-a-week print subscriber to the New York Times since I inherited my law school girlfriend's subscription she stormed out of the apartment. 1996. <laughs> I kept the subscription. I kept the apartment and I kept the subscription and I never let it lapse. That was 28 years. That's so fabulous. I found what you wrote very interesting for two reasons. One, it sounds like your direct supervisor, you name check in the acknowledgements as being really supportive of your work. It sounds like your bosses were actually pretty good to you. It was more like the lateral pressure was what kind of got to you. Can you talk about that a little bit? And then tell us about Todd. Because it sounds like a made-up name. <laughs> it's a made-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I changed his name. For... You know how I know it's a made-up name? Because it's the guy who slept on the couch in BoJack Horseman. And I figured... <laughs> no, I don't watch that. Okay. but Because that's yeah. why I pictured Todd. That's why I pictured Todd. And when I was at the Times and I started reporting on some... Or trying to report on some of the stuff that was going on in 2020. That was really interesting. And I started getting pushback. And I, I think one story got through. And really the pushback came from mostly colleagues, mostly the sort of young union active colleagues who were at the time making it almost their full-time job to help this ideological revolution through at the New York Times. And it, they would basically spend their days in our, at the time, large free form Slack channels, just chastising people, trying to, you know, they would bring up Maggie Haberman and they would try to yell at her about something. And they would obviously tweet about me and call me all sorts of names and things. And it, it was a very social sort of bullying or like middle school bullying. And that was hard because I, I mean, I, I joke, I joke with Bear. It was like, I'd never not been cool. I was like, what, what the hell's going on? Like, we're, <laughs> we're like, I've never not been cool. Yeah. Like uh, I had tons of friends in middle school, high school, things were great. And all of a sudden I get to this place and I'm, and I'm living on the outs. I'm kicked out of slack rooms and uh, people I had dinner with are calling me a fascist. And it was just very shocking on like a personal emotional level. I mean, they would, they started leaking and circulating photos from my Facebook, which had been set to private. It really but... is middle school stuff, eh? Like yeah. it's incredible how quick this utopian social justice stuff does a quantum leap to like the darkest arts of middle school assholery without stopping anywhere in the interregnum space at like just normal decent person yes it's either social justice priesthood or the worst human being you've ever met from grade eight like there's no in between there's no in between so and once you become that person in that in, a, in one of these sort of left-wing communities like at the new york times you're done there's no coming back i will say though it's not that editors weren't involved in it it's that i mostly was surrounded by really loving, great direct boss. So I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. Were you wing Tam? She, she was my boss. She's amazing. And she was always supportive and, and, and wonderful throughout this and trying to help me. Mm -hmm. But it's really, really hard when the entire middle school decides that one kid in the class is a bad kid. But so I, I, but I would say like moments happen where like I describe an editor at one point in, in the office saying in front of a group of colleagues that he heard that I had started dating Bear and he said, um, she's a Nazi. She's a fucking Nazi. Narrator's voice, Barry Weiss is Jewish. Signaled to me like, okay, if an editor is feeling comfortable saying this in front of a group of my colleagues, then we're in a different place. Right. And and basically that this is done for me. I'm going to ask you a question. I, I asked a similar question to Coleman Hughes, who I had on the podcast. As you know, Coleman has his own recently published book. and He is phenomenal. He's a phenomenal writer. And he he started writing at Quillette, I'm proud to say, in 2019 and or maybe 2018. But he had a lot of stories in the book about the ideological excesses that were on display in 2020 and 2021 in the aftermath of the, the horrifying murder of, of George Floyd and the reaction to that. And I asked him, I said, Coleman, a lot of these ideological excesses you're describing, they're terrible, but do you think that would happen in 2024? Like, have things moderated? And I'm going to ask you the same question about the New York Times, because to be fair to the New York Times, like in the last year or two, I get the sense that some of the adults in the room have tried to take the reins back from, from the Todds. Mm. 
people like Pamela Paul have been I love her on as a columnist. She's she's awesome. And even like some of the just the you know, they've had some great front page reporting on trans kids who turn out turn out to be not so trans after all. Might it have been the case that had you stuck it out? I mean, with 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 Barry Weiss, it's it's a different story. It was, it was more public, but with you, had you stuck it out, maybe the cool kids would have let you like sit at their table once a week. <laughs> You might have <laughs> mended fences, realized that you are kind of cool. I mean, could could it have worked out? Absolutely. There's reform happening and efforts to rein things back in. I mean, like just like in San Francisco, I think that there's efforts to rein things back in at the Times. It's a big place with a lot of great reporters. Obviously, the excesses of this and the sort of most self-destructive parts of this movement can be reversed and are being reversed in some ways. At the same time, I think it's a little bit overly optimistic to say, oh, you know what, just because of a few moments of more sane behavior emerging, that it's done. Like I was just listening to audio from UCLA of a required UCLA medical school class in which everyone is told to get on their hands and knees, put their hands on the floor and pray about how America is a white capitalist system and medicine is white science. And I mean, these things are still definitely happening in in just as mainstream as ever. I mean, Seattle just got rid of um, tracked classes. You can't test into advanced courses anymore. For sure, there are more people willing to say, this is crazy, and it's getting harder to smear them. It's getting a lot harder to cast them as absolute monsters than it used to be. Like, let's talk about the stuff with puberty blockers. As we're having this conversation, the big story out of the Mayo Clinic about the uh, carcinogenic effects of those, those drugs. The reality is now that's something we can talk about. A few years ago, it was considered extraordinarily controversial to talk about any side effects of these drugs. Jesse Single, the reason he got controversial is because he wrote about detransitioners. I don't think now it would be controversial to write that. Yeah. And so, of course, the movement of rational, moderate, centrist, whatever you want to call it, or or just like normies, the movement of like normal people is definitely having an impact. Can we talk about your lesbianism a little bit? Because <laughs> there was some secondary character in your book and you said, the woman in question happened to be a lesbian. You said, I approached the woman and we gave each other a certain look as lesbians do. And then for, do you remember that what you were talking about? <laughs> I was at a gun shop. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So you were, you went to a lesbian gun shop. Is it really true? But I read that and I was like, wait a <laughs> second. Is it really true that you can walk into a gun shop and tell whether the gunsmith, I assume she was an accredited gunsmith, was actually a lesbian? Some people do that. <laughs> I, I, Did you validate after? Sure. Was it like after you bought your weapon? Was it like they just... <laughs> I didn't validate. But yeah, sometimes you can just tell. But I didn't validate. I didn't... I didn't, I did not go back and fact check okay. with her. Um, but I, you could definitely, I, you know, as one moves through the world, you figure these things out. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. I think if you were a gay man, you'd certainly be attuned to who are other okay. gay men. But the lesbianism comes in in a more serious way, aside from buying your guns from other lesbians. There are times in the book, you've already mentioned this, it seems to be held against you. You are the first letter in LGBT, and yet, you don't stand up for Latinxes or you don't stand up for BIPOC. Like no one wants to be called Latinx. No one. That is, it is literally an offensive sounding term. If you say that to someone, I'm not for the term Latinx unless someone actually wants to be called Latinx. I'm not for, I'm not for. <laughs> I use it in the same way I use the term turfy smurf. <laughs> this is serious. It feels to me and not just lesbians, but gay men to a certain extent, Jews, Asians, maybe where it's it's the worst of both worlds because you've kind of been more or less kicked out of the oppression club. So you don't get intersectionality. Po- if you're a, a, a white lesbian in, in the United States, it strikes me that in ultra progressive circles, you're a very marginal member of the oppression community. At the same time, it is weaponized against you if you have quote unquote incorrect views. So it's kind of like you're not on the intersectional pyramid or rhombus or whatever the hell they're using now. But they are still using this passive aggressive Jewish grandmother thing to say you of all people should know what it's like to be oppressed. I think, yes, there's the public issue and there's also the personal one. And I wrestle with this in the book is that progress has brought me personally 
a lot. First of all, I'm a woman who can vote. I'm a woman who can open my own bank account. I'm married to a woman. I bought sperm online. Yeah, these are shocking progressive wins. And so when you're in the position of being the beneficiary of so much amazing activism, you are like, I think a little bit more aware of the complexity of the activism. And part of me, I think for a long time, as this movement was taking off, I thought, you know what, this is just the next step in the grand march. This is the next step. How, who am I to say that it ends here with me? How, how can that? And, and I think that that's a fair critique that comes from the left of the kind of moderate liberals. At the same time, I think that if you're talking about women's sports and the idea that anyone who self IDs as a woman should be able to play in women's sports. Yes, that is the next line in a one progressive march, but my progressive march still yeah. believes that women's sports are really good and I want women's sports. And if Venus and Serena Williams had to play against biological males, they, they wouldn't would... get past the qualifiers. So it's kind of a realization that, okay, it's actually okay to say that, yes, there is a march going on, but it's not necessarily a march in a direction of greater equal rights or of greater broad success for humans or broad freedom. I think a lot of the things that I want and that make my life great, that people won for me, it can be described as freedoms. And yeah, that it's more nuanced than the movement would like us to think. And I don't think it's progressive to basically say to hell with girls sports, like we don't need women's sports. I don't think that's progressive. And I'm just not. And I, and I also don't think it's progressive to say that gender non-conforming 14 year olds should be medicated I, without any questions, without any therapy. Like, I don't buy that that's progressive. Actually, I reject that because my progressivism says that gender non-conforming kids are just like I was a butch kid who grew up to be very grateful to have a uterus and, and breasts to breastfeed and all these things. Not that I think that adults shouldn't be able to make whatever choices they want, obviously. I'm not going to buy that it's progressive to tell a 12-year-old who's dressing a little bit off for their sex, that they have something fundamentally off about them that needs American medical intervention. If you don't subscribe to 1950s style sexual stereotypes, you must be defective at being a woman. Or something. Exactly. And for me, it just, I don't buy it. Your tone in your book kind of goes up and down like a sine wave from like straightforward reporting to what I would call like wry comic exasperation. You rarely go into flat out mockery. Uh, and in fact, even when you're talking about this woman who basically canceled you because you wouldn't go online to denounce somebody who had committed some trivial indiscretion, I think at the end, you you say you, in some weird way, you, you actually respected her for canceling you. However, when you get into the stuff about demisexuality and fray sexuality, th these are apparently real things, you, you strain to contain yourself from just openly saying what, what the hell is the problem with these people. <laughs> well, that was just me having a little fun. For those who haven't yet read your book, demisexuality is when you're attracted to people you like and fray sexuality, which seems kind of like sluttiness, is when you, <laughs> you're attracted to people you don't know, which is fine. I mean, but what is somewhat toxic here is two things. First of all, Every nuance of personality is now given its own alphabet code. Some of us are just introspective or we're extroverted or we're this or we're that. It doesn't mean we get our own letter. But the other thing is, and we see this in Canada, especially with like some of the two-spirit indigenous stuff, you have a line here, there is a sense that to be queer is mystical and maybe holy. Mm. You talk about this event called Queering the Future, how LGBTQ foresight can benefit all you don't see this with gay stuff anymore in Canada. You see it with the two-spirit thing because it, it sort of like channels this cosmic idea of the two-spirit person as being kind of like a shamanistic figure. And you see it with trans people as like they're wizards and we're just muggles. Mm. This is very troubling to me because if you told me when I was Harry Potter's age at the beginning of the first novel, you can be a wizard or a muggle. I mean, that's an easy choice, right? Yeah, I think what happened is that... And I try to capture this in the book, but as it became the kind of hierarchy of the progressive stack, the hierarchy of who's at the top of progressivism became very identity focused, very like, which label do you have? If you have that label, then you, you can apply for this job. 
if you have that label, then you'll be considered for this fellowship. I think a lot of people wanted to start picking up some labels. And so, or, and not just out of sort of a careerist way, but also interpersonally, because you're lame if you don't have like a thing or two with, that's kind of like a cool thing. And so I, I, yeah. I phrase it as like the, the gay rights movement won so fully that now everyone wants to join us. They all kind of want to claim a little bit of, of gayness, which is great. I think it's fabulous. I think the whole sort of label system and hierarchy is the problem because people are incentivized to then pick up as many of these as they can and it makes them feel special. Do you meet people who say I'm queer and then you're you kind of like wait and it's like <laughs> like what does that mean? Oh yeah. There was an article in Slate. It was basically about monogamous heterosexual married women in America. A not insignificant percentage of them describe themselves as queer. Yeah. And some of that I think some of that, it's like to show solidarity with gay people who couldn't get married or whatever. Like none of these things on their own are somehow like bad. I don't think it's wrong for a straight person to identify as queer, like whatever makes them happy, like God bless. It's only that it became so valuable that these terms became like, that like that there are jobs that are for LGBTQ plus people. And so you just want to, you throw yourself in with the plus. No, but to me, it's like, so I happen to be Jewish. So it's like if it's like if a Christian person said to me, oh, I'm Jewish, too. I'm a Jew for Jesus. <laughs> Stolen valor. I would regard it as good, like it shows Jews have a high status in society, but also creepy and don't do it. <laughs> so one more question. <laughs> one thing about this book. Can I just say I'm so flattered that you liked it and that you read it's it? It's so good. And I like the ending. And I'm going to tell you why. Because... Like, let's say I just picked this up in a bookstore, right? I wouldn't know that you were married to Barry Weiss. And so, and by the way, Barry's been on this podcast. Before COVID, I was in New York and I interviewed her. I think it was a, it was about her book on anti-Semitism. The way you met Barry is, I think, you were dispatched to, like, lecture her about how problematic she was. <laughs> My first effort, I did go up to try to set her politics straight. I was like, you know what? I wouldn't have a conversation with this, this very, but I was curious okay, about But her. the Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan version of this, where you met cute, is that you were <laughs> like dispatched by HQ to correct her. <laughs> but she was so charming that you ripped off your uniform. You, know, you had to choose. Oh my God, there's, there's definitely a movie in this. But anyway, her name doesn't appear in the whole book as Bear or Barry until the last paragraph, second to last sentence. And it's very sweet. I'm, I'm not going to read it because I won't do it justice, but... Is that something you, I thought it was an incredibly effective literary technique, but is, is that something you thought of or like, did it come to you as you were writing it? Or did you originally intend to make her more explicitly part of the, the action in the book? I'm curious about that choice. Well, I mean, if I'd known she'd get so famous, then of course I would have put her more in the book. I mean, <laughs> we got to sell some copies here. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know like what six I Six months had ago, here. she was famous a year ago. Like, <laughs> <laughs> treading a fine line here right because you're your own writer you've obviously done your own journalism and so was was that kind of something you had to, well how much of Barry do I put in here it doesn't really get into the last couple years of, of like my work life which have been starting a new company with Bear and you've got a new health column oh yeah 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 I've got I do a, I do a news round of I'm doing a health column it's really fun it doesn't like describe that life as much. And I think I also like the privacy of my private life. Maybe at some point I'll write about marriage or motherhood. Or... But success and happiness are boring. Yeah, like our marriage is great and I love being a mom. Your daughter does come in. She comes in a little bit. She comes in a cameo involving a drag performer at your synagogue who is curiously doctrinaire about Judaism. Yeah. Towards the end of writing this, I, towards the, I, I write these chapters about the trans debates and how strange a lot of the pediatric transition language is. And then all of a sudden I get an email and it says, your, your tot Shabbat is going to feature a drag queen this week and it's going to be rainbow tot Shabbat. And I'm sort of like, oh God, like everything is drag queen story hour. It's become it, it, it was like this controversy that would just never end. And now it was in my life. And I was like, this is insane. I, I can't deal with more, more of this, uh, this conversation. And I end up going, obviously, because what else are we going to do? And it was beautiful. I love that you included it because in a way it was kind of off message because culture warriors reading your book want the drag queen to be like, you know, they brought dildos, <laughs> but it wasn't like that at all. 
because normal Tat Shabbats had been actually kind of um, not so Shabbat. Right. It had been a lot of wheels on the bus, a lot of uh, not not enough Judaism for my liking. <laughs> and I, of course, have the zeal of the convert. This drag queen came and she was fabulous and deeply knowledgeable. And it was a deeply Jewish morning. And I was sort of like, just touched by it and just reminded of the complexity of all this and reminded to not be like hysterical about sure. all this. And also, and also reminded of being a teenager in San Francisco and going to drag bars and being like, I think a lot of the conversation around trans issues and obviously trans and drag are separate things. And like, these are all sort of different threads in a bigger conversation, but it's easy to forget the joy and playfulness of this when so much of the movement has been so obsessed with the medicalization and the misery of LGBTQ plus life. Well, the days of remembrance and the days of resistance, and it does get kind of heavy themes. So I, I thought that was a beautiful touch you had there. Thank you so much. Nellie Bowles new book is called Morning After the Revolution, Dispatches from the Wrong Side of History. Nellie, thank you so much for being on the Colette podcast. John, thank you so much for having me. It was just a pleasure. That was fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events.